Now the disclaimer part of today, I am not a psychiatrist, I am not an expert in liaison uh, psychiatry, but I am here to present salutogenesis concepts to you. So that is my disclaimer, so that there is no confusion on that. So, first my foremost pronouns to the illustrious Guru Parampara who enable me to be here in front of you. It is only the blessings of the Guru that enable that. And welcoming all of you to this wonderful event. And again, gratitude is the highest attitude to be expressed at all times. I would like to start off by quoting the father of medicine, Hippocrates where he says that wherever the art of medicine is loved, there is also a love of humanity. And this is where, when I was given this topic by Dr. Ramar sir, I was like, I better at least find out what is this consolidation bias in psychiatry. And I realized it basically is the glue that connects each and every individual who is striving to help a human being. Some people are trying to help from the mental health side, some are trying to help from the emotional health side, some want to help from the physical health side. Who can bring them all together? Who can liaison? Who can be the bridge? And I realized, isn't this what we need today? And the impact of the body on the mind is not something new. The impact on the mind on the body is also not something new. Long, long ago, 5,000 years ago in the Yoga Vashishta, we have the concept of Adhicha Vyadi and Anadhicha Vyadi. And today we can even talk about how Vyadi can cause the Adi. But today my primary focus is Salutogenesis. So what is this Salutogenesis? It is an orientation that focuses our attention on the study of the origin of health and well-being. This is derived from Greek and Latin. So the Latin salus, which means health, and Greek genesis, which means the source. So what are the salutary factors causing or promoting health? And it is always useful to have a comparison. So we can compare it with what we already know, pathogenesis. Pathogenesis is focused on disease. How can I minimize disease? How can I reduce pain or loss? And how can I help the person live or survive? But salutogenesis as a paradigm is looking at what causes health. We want the presence of health. It is for gain and growth. And we want to discover how to live life fully. In, in modern terms, we call it flourishing. We want to go from survival mode to flourishing mode. And you can see that this is and is what in our tradition we call dukkha and Sukha. We want to move from the Dukkha to the Sukha. The heart of Salutogenesis, the core is something called a sense of coherence. And there are three components. The first is, my world is understandable. The second, my world is manageable. And the third, my world has meaning. So when a person feels that their world is understandable, manageable, and has meaning, 
The sense of coherence is there in them and definitely health and wellness are going to manifest. As medical practitioners, we often see the opposite. We see a sense of incoherence. When a diagnosis is given to somebody in the family, either the individual or the family, they go into that, I don't understand what's happening to me. I don't know how to manage. And there's no meaning in life. We see the opposite of this. And that is where their SOC, sense of coherence, has been shown repeatedly to have positive correlation to how we perceive health, mental health and quality of life. In this process, we have something called general resistance resources. These are the resources. If you think of this as the stream of life in the center, the red side, of course, is death. The green side is, of course, total health. Sense of coherence is in the middle. If you have the resistance resources, you go towards health. The absence of the resistance resources, you go towards mortality, morbidity, as we can see there. So what is this resource? Recently, we had a webinar on cellulogenesis with experts in the field. And one of the experts gave a beautiful definition of GRR. She said, behind my house, there is a woods, a forest. It is a resource. If I daily take a walk in that wood, it becomes a general resistance resource. If I don't, it is just a resource. You have the wonderful Godavari here. I have the beach, Bay of Bengal, in front of my ashram in Pondicherry. It is a resource. If I go and swim in it daily, if I go and walk by that river daily, then it becomes a resistance resource. If not, if you don't have it, it goes into the deficits. And we owe this modern concept to Professor Aaron Antonovsky. Yesterday was 7th of July, was his 29th death anniversary. And in our Institute of Cellulogenesis and Complementary Medicine at Pondicherry, within a medical institute, you can see that we last year on his birthday, 19th December, inaugurated a plaque in honor of him. Our focus is to move from pathogenesis. We have for too long focused on what is wrong instead of understanding what is right. Build on the positive. Acknowledge the negative, but build on the positive. And this is what we have been doing in our university. And our former vice chancellor, who was my professor of medicine, Sedhava Mansar, he opened our heart and mind to cellulogenesis 10 years ago. And he defined healing about becoming whole is what healing is all about. And we have created what we call Purnam. It is our model of cellulogenic communication of wholesomeness in a clinical setting. So within a clinical setting, creating cellulogenic communication of wholesomeness, and this is one of the chapters in a recent book on effective medical communication using cellulogenesis. Humanistic healthcare. Still in our beloved country, we still have some humanistic healthcare. You go abroad, it is total mechanical. People have stopped treating the human being, they have stopped treating the diagnosis, and they are only treating lab reports. We at least still look at the other person and try to look them eye to eye. But I see it getting lost. The humanistic healthcare is so important because otherwise what happens, we have heard from the morning, how people are targeting the medical profession as lacking a humanistic approach. And it may not be totally true, but we cannot wish it away. And this is why we need to move towards a cellulogenic health promoting focus. So how can we go out of this? Well, an emphasis on patient care that identifies and addresses the causes of health and well-being. So we want to ask, what is it that keeps you healthy, rather than what makes you sick all the time? And we look at health promotion to optimize wellness. I must remind each and every one of us in this hall, we are healthcare providers, so we must care. Health, care, provider. Don't forget that caring part. How do we care? With love, with compassion, and with competence.
This is why quoting from the movie Patch Adams, he said, you treat a disease, you win, you lose. You treat a person, I guarantee you, you will win no matter what the outcome. And let's go to William Osler, father of modern medicine, often termed. The good physician treats the disease. The great physician treats the patient who has the disease. Looking at the individual rather than the diagnosis. And this is where I would like to say that healing has faded from medical attention. We are focused on curing, not healing the individual. And to heal is to once again achieve wholesomeness of a person. That wholesomeness of a person, what does it mean? It's physical, emotional, intellectual, social, spiritual. Sounds like the yoga concept of Panchakosha. If you look at it, all those dimensions are there. And this is why I am suggesting we need a shift and change our paradigm from what did I do today to treat disease of illness to what did I do today to promote health and wellness. That paradigm shift is required in our medical care. Aristotle, a couple of thousand years ago, suggested eudaimonia as a well-lived life where we fulfill our ultimate purpose and give meaning. There is an abiding contentment in flourishing. Remember I said, let's move from survival mode, that is brainstem mode, to flourishing mode, which is prefrontal cortex. Let's shift from the old to the new. And Abraham Maslow brought this into self-actualization. The Japanese have it as Ikigai. And you think only the Japanese have it? Of course, we Indians have had it for thousands of years even before that as Swadharma. Living the purpose for which we are here. Because when we live our purpose, serotogenic well-being will manifest. Antonovsky proposed that the experience of well-being is based on this sense of coherence. And I would like to take it a step further. When we can communicate with our patients in such a way that these aspects come alive, it is a sense for coherence. So sense of coherence, you communicate and you manifest in the other person sense for coherence which we as healthcare providers must develop. It is only then that the health promoting aspects will come. But for this to happen, we have to know the other person. We have to liaison with them. We have to communicate with them. Why don't we do it? Knowing the person takes time and patience. We have to tap into their potential. Each individual has divine potential. Aham Brahmasmi. It's not a joke. It's the reality. But we forget it, and so we get blocked. And how can we help them understand, manage their life with purpose? The three components of SOC, understand your life, manage it, and have purpose. Because people are not aware of it. People are not aware of the potential. But we, as an external observer, can help them. And this we can go to the Ramayan. <laughs> not Adi Govish for sure. But we can go to Ramayan, where we find Jambhava. Bringing Hanuman out of what I call the Hanuman complex. Hanuman had all the Ashtama Siddhis. He had all these amazing potentialities. And he says, I don't think I can do it. And he took the wise Jambavan. Can we as a healthcare provider be the Jambavan to our patients who are coming to us, who are the Hanuman, who have the infinite healing capacity that they have not tapped into? And this is where the very stressor the very stressor can become a catalyst of transformation. It is said that which doesn't kill you makes you better. It's a very good statement. And if it kills you, it's over. Why worry about it? Antonovsky has given the same concept. The stressor, everybody has stress. You have stress, I have stress, the person on the street has stress, PM Modi more, more has stress, everybody has stress, okay? But how do you perceive that stress? That is where everything changes. If I perceive it as a challenge to become a better me, I work on that health promotion side, cellulogenesis, H+. If I say, oh my God, God doesn't like me, nobody likes me, I have the worst family, I have the worst society, I have the worst doctor, naturally H- occurs. How do you perceive it? Can we communicate that to our patients? 
that how they perceive the stress. I, I often tell people, nothing can stress you if you don't let it stress you. When once you let it stress you, then all that HPA access and sympathetic autonomic comes in. This is why the CAM therapies, complementary and alternative therapies, have given so much of hope to so many people. And alternative always has antagonism, A for A. So alternative means either you or me. If you are in the room, I will go out. If I am in the room, you get out. That is the problem with the word alternative. Complementary means we can work together. So instead of you or me, it becomes you and me. But the best one, of course, integrated, which is us. And this is where I would like to express my gratitude to Gangadhar sir, who created that integrative medicine department at Demands. You don't know the struggle. You don't know the struggle. Having been witness to a lot of the history, that is a big, big challenge. In integrated medicine, it is us. Because to heal the person, you need lifestyle. You need attitude, you need relaxation, and don't forget, you need breathing. These are essential components. And this is why our yoga therapy today, and that is my primary field of focus, we are looking at the biopsychosocio-spiritual model that Sir talked about earlier in one of the talks this morning, where the biological aspects are taken care of, the sociological aspects are taken care of, the psychological and never, never, never forget the spiritual aspects. That is where our culture always gives space for the spirituality of healing. Remember all traditional cultures, the doctor was also the spiritual guide. Later on they divided, spirituality is different, science is different, thanks to the Renaissance and the guys in Europe and everybody is split it up. Health promotion in mental health care. And going straight to the WHO, they are stressing, we need to strengthen the individual. The individual is at the center of our healthcare system, we forget that. I have to often remind my colleagues, the hospital exists for the sake of the patients, not just to pay our salary. The education institution exists for the sake of the students, not just to pay our salary. We have to remember that individual needs to be strengthened. The community needs to be strengthened. And the structural barriers to mental health have to be broken down. This is why Antonovsky has suggested a shift. What is this shift? Shifting from the use of unconscious psychological defense mechanisms to the use of conscious coping mechanisms. This is one methodology. Moving from the rigidity of defensive structures to a capacity for constant and creative inner readjustment, inner readjustment, not outside. That is where the guidance of the spirit comes in. Where stage of emotional energy can we move towards a productive use of that emotional energy? Emotional suffering can we move towards joyful ease, which is of giving rather than getting, 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 giving. Moving from what can I get from you to what can I share? Sharing is caring, never forget that. And from narcissism to giving of oneself. The more you give of yourself, the happier you're going to be. The happier you are, the healthier you're going to be. Very simple. The more you're focused on what can I get from everything, the more sad and depressed you're going to be. Very simple. If you're in a relationship to get something, congratulations, it's going to be a failed relationship. If you're in a relationship to give something, it's going to be a successful relationship no matter what other factors are there. And the exploitation of others, can we move from that to reciprocal interaction, mutual acceptance, self-respect? And this is why I would like to suggest a mental health promotion process based on the senatogenic model of health. And this is from Lang Lang in 2007 who made this suggestion where they said that we want to increase the tolerance for various feelings. How can we do that? By moving towards health based on the sanitary concept of health as a continuum. So I'm going in the river. I'm, I'm looking from outcome based, you know, is what we are all looking today. Improving the active adaptation. How? By universalizing the mental health challenges. By introducing a metaphor of the stream of life. Life is like a river. How you 
move in that river determines how healthy you are. Some people are still staying on the bank of the river, not going any place. You have to jump into life at some point and swim, either upstream or downstream. And again, the story of the participant, rather than diagnosis as a narrow description, experiencing the person as a whole person, structuring the life experience that can reinforce a sense of coherence. What does that person have in the life that can give them purpose? What gives them meaning? What are the parts of the life they understand? How can we strengthen that? And we look at the perception of coping as the identity from the participant's side. We want to improve the self-identity by extending coping resources. These are the health-promoting factors from the salicogenesis point. Pay attention to what is happening good. See, they have 101 problems. What is not a problem? What are you able to do? Focus on that. How are you able to do it? And we move towards that. And this is where the perception of the quality of social support. One good thing in our country is still we have social support system. In Western countries, they are just broken down and somebody is not well, there's not even somebody to take care of them anymore. They have broken down to such a bad system. We want to nurture, we want to give reassurance of the worth, create a reliable alliance and guidance. And of course, stress, tension and strain, they don't have to always make you sick. They can make you a better you. You go to the gym and you work against the weights to build your muscles. Just like you build your physical muscles, you can build emotional muscles, you can build spiritual muscles. By saying, okay life, you have me this, give me more, I am ready to do a bit of push-ups against your problem. And experiencing one's resources. And that is why the salicogenic principle of active adaptation. If you look at health, actually it's a lot about active adaptation. How well do you adapt to the situation? physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, and spiritually, determines how healthy you are. And so what is the motivation for change? This is what we need to communicate. We need to bring, what is that motivation that can change the person? I remember my professor of medicine, Sayadur Raman Sir, saying, there was a man who was a chain smoker, and he kept on trying to convince him to stop. And then one day he said, what is the most important, who is the most important person in your life? And he said, my grandson. And he said, do you want your grandson to have a living grandpa or a dead grandpa? And that man never smoked again. Because he was motivated by being the grandpa to his grandson. That created that change in that person. Can we focus on what is it that can motivate the person? And thinking more about salutogenic and positive patterns. What are the positive things you can do? You can get up in the morning, wonderful. Here are a few things you can do. You cannot get up in the morning, here are a few things you can do. You stay up late, here are a few things you can do. You go to sleep early, here are a few things you can do. Irrespective of what they say, you find something that they can do rather than say you are useless. The moment you say you are useless, the moment you say nobody can do anything for you, you have already sealed the coffin. And that is why, coming back to the original topic, liaison consultation psychiatry. Another colleague of mine, Sledge, 2015 has given this beautiful suggestion. This is of course more working in the nursing care side, but still moving from a reactive model to a proactive model. More than just being a single discipline to multidisciplinary. Today we are talking of multidisciplinary teams. Gandhara sir was saying, the multidisciplinary team of integrated health should be so well integrated, there's no separation at all. It becomes one. You don't say, once you put the salt in the water, you don't say, this is salt and that is water. It becomes salt water, that's all. It becomes one entity. And similarly, rather than waiting for the primary team to make a request, can we have screening based on records? Rather than waiting for the advice of the primary team, can we collaborate with the nurses, the social workers, the clinicians? Can we work on prevention rather than treatment? We are always, after the dam bursts, we want to plug it. Can we prevent the dam from bursting in the first? And again, the team, it should be embedded 
I often say with yoga therapy, music therapy, which I have an institute, you know, there should be in every team, there should be a yoga therapist, a music therapist, so that then you don't have to go out of it. You don't have to go looking for it. You need somebody who can focus on wellness as part of the whole team. So coming back to my main point for today, we need a change in paradigm. From what did I do today to treat disease or illness, to what did I do today to promote health and wellness. I would like to express my gratitude to the Star Society. It is a free membership in the University of Zurich. They have a center of selective genesis and that stars society.org, you can all become members, they have very good resources and this handbook of selective genesis is uh, the bible of selective genesis, you can download it for free, it is an uh, amazing resource and in the next uh, edition uh, the team has promised me I may have a yoga therapy chapter in it so I am looking forward to that and this is my small team, a 10 member team in the schools of yoga therapy, music therapy of the Institute of Selective Genesis and Complementary Medicine, Sri Balaji Vidyapit. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. Ganyavar. Thank you. A very inspiring uh, talk by, and for a uh, psychiatric conference such as this, gave us another facet of our clinical application. Let me uh, congratulate uh, possible in this conference. We of course can take a few questions. There are any? Yes sir. It's a bi-directional and I think in our consultation work, there's a lot of bi-directional. And what I am suggesting is not a neglect of the diagnosis, but an addition of positive support. So we are looking at our clinical diagnosis, we are looking at the disease, because pathogenesis is not really separate from cellulogenesis. Cellulogenesis is a big Venn diagram, circle. Hmm? Pathogenesis is one part of it. So pathogenesis lies within cellulogenesis, but if we are only looking at pathogenesis, we lose cellulogenesis. So what we are suggesting is to expand our uh, perspective to include also the positive factors, not a neglect of the negative. This is my suggestion. Sir. So thank you, sir. Uh, I'm the member of cellulogenesis uh, for the patients who come to us. Thank you. So one thing which we have found very useful is uh, active listening. I think active listening is a very important skill for any clinician. And start to look for factors that are giving them joy in life. So often you can ask a question, what gives you happiness in life? What makes you feel like getting up in the morning? What is it that you feel makes life livable? Which parts of your life do you find are manageable? And that gives you a key. And as I said with the grandfather who stopped smoking because he wanted to be alive for his grandson, you will find something that motivates them. It may be the job, it may be that dog, walking the dog may be what motivates them to get up in the morning. And then we work on it. Now in our own institute, we use techniques of yoga therapy and music therapy to give those resistance resources. So yoga and music, as general resistance resources and yoga therapy, music therapy, which are personalized approach as specific resources. So someone who is having depression, you start to give them practices to enable the wellness component to come along with it. So, uh, for example, I would say somebody comes from psychiatry and I must say psychiatry department was the first department in our university that opened up to yoga. And then now all departments are open. And I was sharing how the patients would be sent to us. 
Then they said, if you send the patient to you, some of them run off in between because we are in a different building. So we said, we use the yoga therapist to the ward. So the yoga therapist, the music therapist goes to the ward, meets them where they are, gives them some practices to help them center. They find themselves because people have lost themselves. And most of the time, people feel they have hope in the world. And I don't have hope. And in music therapy, they find beautiful songs that people like. They sing the song. They play the song on violin. They play the song on an instrument. And the person just comes out of that negative state. So we are utilizing yoga therapy, music therapy techniques. But I think the key is to just be aware that we need to look for the positive in the middle of the negative. It was quite given that we have to say that the coronavirus would not go to cure the pollution or something. The job is to look after the lung which is damaged. So, don't you think similar uh, pattern can be done somewhere else too? Why do you, I think, uh, going to make, going to give it a whole list? Is it possible? Practically not possible, isn't it? The science is advancing so much. Yes. Tomorrow, you will sell small itself, somebody will be studying more itself. Exactly. So how do how, how you solve this? So what we are finding is that we have adopted the Western model which is reductionism. So we have forgotten the whole person and we are only looking at an organ and the way we are going we may start looking at only one part of the organ. That is how we have gone. So what we are trying to say is in that let us not lose the bigger picture. We need speciality. But if, I'm going, if, I, if I have a kidney issue, I'll go to the nephrologist for sure. I'm not going to go to a general practitioner. But th that is a specific situation. But what has happened today is, uh, my father in the last uh, days of his life was in Apollo Hospital in Chennai. I was a young medical student at that time in Nalpur. I came back and I saw the pulmonologist came in, checked the lungs, the nephrologist, the, you know, each one did their part. And, Okay, okay, okay. Person is not okay, he died. But what has happened, it is like, I will only focus on this and I won't think of that. So what is important is we need focus, but we should not lose focus. There is, there is a concept in English, uh, missing the wood for the trees. No, my point is that it's easier said than done. Because science has grown so much that it's impossible for an individual to understand Everything you can understand, you can understand uh, lung, understand brain, understand. Uh, we find, like, uh, we also get cases where they just, like, not because they lack, they, 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 they don't have that knowledge of yes. uh, this. Thing. So I don't know how to solve this. this is true, true, sir. I accept the difficulty in that. No, but but I can't understand the approach, look after that heart, knowing the echocardiograms and all that. Exactly. But, sir, so all I, respectfully, all I'm submitting is the nephrologist shouldn't forget, forget they're dealing with a whole person. That's all. I, my, my thing is that don't forget it is a whole person in your focus. Respectfully submitting. And uh, there is a signal from the other end that we have crossed zero. So, I request uh, my colleague, uh, Imkar, to make it. Let me personally thank uh, Dr. Bhavan for uh, keeping us quite alert by way of this talk. Although post lunch we tend to sleep off, uh, I think it was an extremely illustrative presentation. Thank you very much. I thank the organizers for letting me share this uh, chair along with Dr. Alan Bhavan and Dr. Yamakar to complete this session. Questions, of course, can go on. Bhavan uh, will be here. Till 11 part of the day. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for this.